Well, welcome to Rock House. This is one of the six areas of Hocking Hills State Park. And I wanted to start our hike here today right up at the top, right by the Shelter House, which is a great place for anybody to start a hike here. A lot of people come to Rock House looking for the geology, the flora and the fauna when they get out here, but you need to understand a little bit about the history of this place. If you go back to 1835, there was a retired military colonel by the name of F.F. Rempel that decided uh, this was an awful pretty place down here in the Hocking Hills. And he thought, you know, what a great place for a hotel. And little did he know what he was starting. Now it's one of the tourist destinations in the state of Ohio. But initially, Colonel Rempel built the very first hotel in the Hocking Hills. And the site of our shelter house is exactly where that hotel stood. Uh, it was a 16 room hotel. It had a U.S. post office built in. It had a livery stable, a restaurant. It even had some beautiful gardens out front here that folks could walk in the gardens, etc. It made it until just after the turn of the century, uh, so the building itself was taken down. There's some really massive and beautiful uh, spruce and fir trees, uh, 200 years old. Uh, that's a quick tip off right there that those are not native trees to the Hocking Hills, so somebody had to bring them here and plant them here. But this is where you should start for your rock house hike. We started up at Colonel Rempel's old hotel site. Just as you start down the trail though, uh, the only little piece of Colonel Rempel's hotel, the only, the only evidence left that it ever existed, is a little tiny garden wall. I mentioned earlier that you know, he loved gardening and he had beautiful gardens for folks to walk in when they came here. And for the most part, all of it's gone. Well, little wall, there are some tips that this was one of his gardens. We have a, a little escapee ground cover here called Vinca or Myrtle. It's got, it's got a lot of different names. Uh, it's not a native, another one of those non-natives, and it has escaped from the garden just a little bit through the years. Uh, but to be honest, really, that's it. Surrounding me here, uh, I've got a, a small bush, and there's quite a few of them all around me here. And uh, we're talking history here today, so we might as well talk about it just a little bit. This is one of those really cool Appalachian history moments, I guess, uh, when you get into the Hocking Hills. Uh, back a few hundred years ago, we got a little mad at old Mother England and uh, had a little Revolutionary War. And everybody remembers the old Boston Tea Party, but what I always get to, I guess, the most tickled about is everybody remembers, hey, we got mad and they were taxing us, uh, so we threw the tea into the harbor. But what they don't realize is what happened afterwards when all of the English, French, German descendants looked over the boats and went, gosh, we love tea, now what are we going to do, right? So they had to find some alternatives now that they weren't taking in those imports. And this is one of them right here. This small bush that you see right here, uh, kind of nondescript little leaves right here, uh, but this guy is called the spice bush. And the spice bush, as its name implies, very aromatic. It would dry the leaves and it became a fantastic substitute for tea. The little berries that it gets on it were so pungent, they would dry those and actually use them for substitutes for nutmeg and allspice. So this was a really important bush to our early settlers in the area, but has kind of been forgotten over time. Uh, but uh, one little crush and, and you'll remember what it's all about. All right, well, we're making our way down the trail here at Rock House, and we've been talking a lot about the history of this area, but let's talk a little uh, flora and fauna. I always say, if you're coming to the Hocking Hills, if you truly want to understand Hocking Hills State Park, you got to understand the hills. I mean, that's what we're all about. When you leave Columbus, when you leave uh, Dayton, uh, any of those areas, and you make your way here to Southeastern Ohio, just south of Lancaster or just east of Chillicothe, everything goes like this. The hills really start to kick in down here. That goes back to a time when the Appalachians were uplifting out of an ocean, draining the ocean, and drying up the land. And as this was occurring, literally that ocean draining was eroding the Appalachians at the same time. That eroded material, the sand, the silt, the rock, the gravel, made its way to areas just like this in southeastern Ohio, began to settle, pile, settle, pile, and eventually formed the rolling hills we're walking around in now. What's great about hill country, though, is what you find at the top of the hill is very different than what you find at the bottom of the hill. And what I mean by that is there are several plants and forest communities that like their feet dry. Oaks, hickories, trees like that 
love to be at the tops of the slopes where the water drains quickly through the sandstone, dries out, keeps their feet dry. As we start to move down the slope like we are here, we'll start to see lots of sugar maples, American beech trees, and one of my favorites, I like to call this guy the uh, burnt cornflake tree. Uh, it's an easy way to identify this tree year round. If you look at the bark, it looks like it's covered with burnt cornflakes. Uh, but what this really is, this is the wild black cherry. And it is a cherry tree. You can eat the cherries if you're into sour. Uh, it's got some serious pucker power to it if you try to eat this guy. Uh, but I know, you know, I know some folks that, you know, wild black cherry pie every year, I guess. Put enough sugar in anything, eventually it'll taste good, right? Uh, but this is a good example of a mid-slope tree. As we move farther down the hill, it'll change completely again. Uh, but for now, I want to just uh, remind you a little bit about where you are in the hill country. All right, we've been going up and down a little bit, down into a few ravines and back up. We, we've risen just a little bit before we drop down to the rock house. And we're back into that drier soil I talked about. Uh, and you've got this wonderful tree behind me back here. Massive, massive. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's have a little fun. Make your way down to a park just south of Nelsonville, Ohio, called Burr Oak State Park. Walk up to the manager, ask if you can see the Burr Oaks at Burr Oak State Park. Uh, he's not going to appreciate me sending you down because I'll tell you a little secret, folks. There are no Burr Oaks at Burr Oak State Park. It was an accident. When the settlers were arriving into southeastern Ohio, they found this massive tree with rather un-oak looking leaves on it. And when they found this guy, it reminded them of their bur oak trees back in England. And so they began to call them that. They began to name the whole region the bur oak region. And eventually it became bur oak state park. Well, what's kind of funny is a few years later, they must've taken their naturalist with them who said, uh, folks, not a bur oak tree. Those are chestnut oaks. Uh, and so basically the entire park in the area was misnamed. But chestnut oaks love our sandstony, iron-rich slopes that we have here in southeastern Ohio. Burr oak prefer more western Ohio in the limestone country, the alkaline soils you'd find over in that part of Ohio. Uh, but they look very, very similar. Um, the biggest difference is in the acorn. Burr oaks always look like they need a haircut around the edge. Uh, but a very unique tree, but a great example of what the Appalachian forest can look like. I love these guys too because they tend to get this 90 degree branching going on out there, but a few of those mid-slope trees. All right guys, uh, great place to stop and talk about the sandstone itself. I mentioned earlier that the hills made of blackhand sandstone called black hand because the natives had painted these giant black hands on the rock walls marking their way to Flint Ridge up near Newark where they would collect their flint. So when the geologists were hunting for a name for this type of sandstone they called it black hand sandstone. But sandstone is a true conglomerate. If you look at the stone itself lots of pieces and materials. Small sand grains, gravel, bits of quartz, silica, and if you'll notice through here the reds and the purples running through there um, those are literally oxidized uh, pieces of iron, uh, loaded with iron in our sandstone here. So much so that in the 1800s, about 1823, 24, up to about 1865, Southeastern Ohio, West Virginia, number one iron producers in the country at the time. Uh, that's what they did. They extracted this iron from the rock to make the railroad tracks that covered this nation. Uh, the cannons for the Civil War were made from, all this material was made here. But uh, sandstone's pretty cool stuff. Because it's made up of all those little bits and pieces of everything, it's easily eroded. You know, thank goodness for the Hocking Hills, right? Uh, it washes away the softer layers that aren't as well cemented and leaves behind these spectacular cliff walls and gorges and recess caves that we find all over the area. Uh, this particular one loaded with iron, that's the red you see, if you look up, you'll see lots and lots and lots of small little holes all over this rock. But what you're really seeing in there is weak spots. The water seeps through, hits a loose pocket of sand, a loose piece of gravel, spits it out, and you're left with these little rings of harder iron oxide. And the true name of that, if you get a good look at it, you'll see why it's called honeycomb weathering. And uh, it's just a type of weathering that goes on in the sandstone. But because it's so inconsistent, you get all of these cool shapes everywhere here in the gorge. All 
All right, welcome to the Rock House, guys. You are standing in. The Rock House is unique in the Hocking Hills because it's the closest thing we have to a true cave. Although we really don't have caves in Sandstone. The caves we have most of the time here, such as Ash Cave, uh, Cantwell Cliffs, uh, Old Man's Cave, they're recessed caves, hollowed out areas in the cliff wall. Here at Rock House, things happen a little bit different. Instead of the water coming along, carving away the outside of the sandstone, it worked its way down the hill that we just hiked down, and about halfway down the hill, it found a crack, and the water got into a crack, and through time, it began to slowly erode the sandstone from the inside out. But sandstone being like it is, it couldn't hold the water, couldn't seal it up such as a limestone cave might, something like that. So it eventually had to escape. Began to carve little rivulets in the back of the, of the rock house cave itself. And the water would work its way across the cave. And eventually, everywhere you'd have a groove on the back, you have one of these giant gothic looking windows on the opposite wall. And basically, that's where the water escaped. There's one about every 20 to 30 feet here in the rock house letting the water out. Now, legends talk about uh, thieves and scallywags and renegades coming here all the time. And I always laugh about that because I'm going to tell you the truth. We were not the first to discover the rock house. Matter of fact, the natives have been coming here literally for thousands of years. And they even left some evidence behind. Uh, we have some small little square troughs carved into the floor of the rock house here. There's three of them all together. There used to be more, but they've been weathered and smoothed through time. But basically what's going on is the water is seeping through the sandstone, about 50 to 60 feet of solid rock. And then it seeps out of the rock wall right here inside the rock house. Well, the natives carved these little troughs to catch that water. Very, very clean water when it came out of the rock that they could drink, they could use for cooking, whatever they needed. Um, unfortunately, I don't recommend drinking out of them now because our native rock doves have made their way here into the rock house, they nest here, uh, they bathe in those little troughs uh, uh, along with other things in those little troughs. So I don't recommend drinking the water from them anymore. But if it wasn't for that, technically the water would still be clean enough to drink from them. Uh, but rock house is fascinating. Thieves and renegades, right? Nah, too famous. You've got natives that have been coming here for thousands of years. You've got Colonel Rempel who built a hotel up top. He used to give tours down here. And instead of a, a security radio on their belt, their tour guides had carving tools. You know, nowadays, it's illegal to carve on the rocks here in the park. But in those days, you know, for about a quarter tip, they'd crawl up on the walls of the rock house or up on the roof, and they would literally carve your name or whatever you wanted into it itself. You put all that together, it'd be a terrible place to hang out. Uh, not to mention, could you imagine inside the rock house getting in a gunfight? I wouldn't want to be in here when the bullets started to ricochet everywhere. I know that. So. But from a natural standpoint, the largest winter hibernacula in southeastern Ohio, which is a winter uh, bat hibernation area. Uh, literally, thousands of bats work their way up into the top of the rock house, deep into the crevice up there, and hibernate for the winter. Uh, they can be seen here at any time. We're not too worried. The ceiling is so high, nobody can get to them, so they're nice and safe and secure up there for the winter. But rock house is a fascinating place to come and explore. We're kind of on the outside of the rock house. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the carving that went on inside from Colonel Rempel's hotel days. And I mentioned, yep, nowadays illegal. But in those days, really cool graffiti that you would find inside. Uh, but probably the coolest carving, one of the coolest carvings in the whole park, but definitely the coolest one here at the rock house, is on the outside of rock house when you're looking up at it. Uh, behind me on the wall up here, you'll actually see a face looking back at you. And that face belongs to a particular individual you may have heard of by the name of Tecumseh. Probably one of the most famous Shawnee that ever lived. He grew up not too far from here in the town of Gilagathe. Right nowadays we call that Chillicothe, but in those days it was Gilagathe. It was the home village of the Shawnee. And as a boy, he would come here to the Hakhaking. Nowadays the Hocking Hills, but in those days the Delaware word Hakhaking meant the bottleneck or gooseneck shape where the water would flow down into the cliff walls. But he grew up here. 
This was a special place. They visited here. They came here. He came here as a teenager to go bear hunting, which I know sounds like a Daniel Boone story. But what he was really doing uh, in those days, they would come up here and they would catch the bear while they were sleeping away the hot afternoons, etc., in the grottos and the caves here. And there's a good reason for that. In those days, they hunted bear with about a six or seven foot long spear or lance. I mean, I'll leave it to you. Uh, you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in the forest or catch him while he's sleeping. You know, it makes sense. So he grew up here. Had he pulled off what he had planned, our Ohio history would be very different than it is today. But uh, it didn't work for him. But when he died in that final battle all the way up into Canada, his body disappeared from the battlefield. Now, I think every county in Ohio would like to claim that they have Tecumseh's body in their county. Nobody knows for sure where he is. But we do know that about a year or two after his death, the journal records began to talk about the faces of Tecumseh. They all look the same. Uh, you can tell it's a Native American appearance to the face, but one of the things a lot of folks don't know about the Shawnee is they didn't wear feathers in their head, etc. The Shawnee wore turbans, often made of cotton or silk. And Tecumseh, well, he wore one bright crimson red because he said he wanted his enemies to see him coming in battle. And if you'll notice on the carving, it is a turban on the head. But all the faces, I know of five in the area. This is by far the best that I've ever seen here at Rock House. Uh, they're all facing in the same direction. They all look identical, and they all appeared about a year to two years after his death. Um, so pretty interesting carving when you start looking back on it. But it's a beautiful location. It overlooks the valley here at the Rock House, and right below him, a great little grove of one of their favorite trees, the Shawnee loved the little pawpaw tree. And if you're not familiar with that little Appalachian fruit, you're missing something, guys. It tastes like somebody sugared down a banana if you get a hold of one of those. The problem is they can't be cultivated because almost as fast as you pick them, they rot. But if you can catch them and they're fresh, they're delicious. Beautiful location to look for the face of Tecumseh on the front of Rock House. We're making our way back up from Rock House, but this is one of those spots right here where, as I like to say, this is where northern Canada meets southern Appalachia. The time of the glaciers that rolled across Ohio covered Michigan, Indiana, most of Ohio until they reached the hills here of southeastern Ohio. Here they stopped. I mean, glaciers are good, but contrary to popular belief, they cannot move hills or mountains. So when they reached the edge of the Hocking Hills, they stopped. Where we're standing right now, the last glacier in Ohio, the Wisconsin Glacier, stopped 10 miles from the Rock House and seven miles from Cantwell Cliffs here in the park, but it just couldn't get in. But it did kind of shove Canada in front. And what I mean by that is the plants and the animals couldn't live under all the ice, so they had to come south. They lived here for a few thousand years and then everything changed. The climate warmed up, the glaciers melted, receded, headed north. And for the most part, those species went with them back to their northern Canada home. Except here, deep in the bottom of the gorges, you get quite a few Canadian species, such as yellow and black birch, or Canada yew bushes, or as we can see off to my side here, northern or Canadian hemlock trees. But they have to be associated with those deep gorges, that cool air conditioning effect down in the gorges here at Hocking Hills. So the farther you leave, the less of those you will find. And this is a fantastic example as you make your way up the trail from the backside of Rock House. It's almost a perfect line of where the northern or eastern hemlock trees stop and southern Appalachian forest, beech, maple, oak, hickory begins. It's almost a perfect line right here and it's something worth taking a look at when you come out of the rock house. We're out on the edge of the picnic area in the parking lot, and a great edge tree that has this kind of cool little historical uh, connection as well. We'll finish up with this guy. One of my favorite trees in the forest. Very easy to identify because it's one, one of the only trees in the forest that actually has three different shaped leaves on one tree. You have a traditional round leaf, the mitten shape, and you've got, as my son likes to refer to this, the dinosaur footprint on the other side. This is the sassafras tree. And this guy was famous, uh, but kind of forgotten. 
the settlers quickly realized by digging up the roots loaded with the sassafras sugar in the winter, they could make this wonderful tasting purple tea. Uh, it was delicious. And then somebody thought, well, put a little sugar in there because everything's better with sugar, right? And then somebody thought, well, let's put a little carbonated water in there. And they came up with America's very first soft drink. It was called sarsaparilla. Later, it evolved and became known as root beer. Uh, but the fun part about root beer is if you look on the labels uh, nowadays, uh, don't look for sassafras because we've now discovered that if you drink enough of this over a long period of time, it's slightly carcinogenic. But although they don't use sassafras anymore, the flavor's still the same. Come out and enjoy some. <laughs>